Okay, well I'm really um, excited to be here presenting this because I think everybody here at NERSC is really excited about the, you know, the upcoming Perlmutter system and, and GPUs and the potential that it has. So um, it's, it's really exciting to get a chance to share that with you as well. Um, this? Okay, there we go. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, I'm just going to kind of give you a high-level introduction to why um, we are excited about GPUs here, and um, you know why you should be too, and what the what the potential is. Um, so, you know, NERSC is the Mission HPC Center for the Department of Energy's Office of Science, and so. What that means is that predominantly our mission is to, to advance science and uh, what the scientists continually tell us is they need more and more and more cycles, uh, more and more compute resources, storage resources to stay competitive in sort of a global science um, um, uh, kind of community. And uh, what that, that means is that we both need to have a mission of advancing science, but also a mission of kind of advancing the state of the art in supercomputing so that the scientists who use NERSC kind of maintain a competitive advantage in this global scientific community. Um, so this is sort of a, a challenge, and when we, and we bring in a new supercomputing system, we have to think about the 7,000 users, 800 projects, 700 codes. Um, that, uh, that, that kind of use and rely on NERSC resources to, um, to, to produce this science. And so um, one of the things that we've realized over the last decade or so is that in order to maintain this kind of competitive advantage to supply the user base with the resources they need, we need to move to these sort of energy efficient um, exascale-like architectures that, um, that kind of put us on a new trajectory for, for computing. And what, uh, what this really means is that sort of change has arrived in computer architecture. And at NERSC, we really see it as our mission to make sure that as the HPC community moves towards these energy efficient exascale-like architectures that um, you know, the greater scientific computing community, those 7,000 users that rely on NERSC, don't get, get left behind. Um, and so this slide is just kind of a, a motivation of how, how and why that change is coming about. It's largely driven by the consumption uh, of power and sort of heat dissipation that is pushing uh, hardware vendors towards uh, kind of lightweight cores and what I was kind of describing as exascale-like architectures. So this plot here kind of shows a trajectory of um, energy per flop over time, and you can see that these, these uh, kind of two flat lines here are, are basically business as usual, uh, whereas the many core and heterogeneous computing lines are down here. As you can see that you make a substantial several orders of magnitude increase in capability by, by uh, kind of switching from traditional heavyweight server processors to these lightweight um, processors. And we started this transition with the Cori system at NERSC, uh, which is largely powered by these Intel Knights Landing many core processors. And um, you know, what we found is that Cori, Cori is a boon uh, to science in the US because of the new capability that it brings. Um, but the Intel Xeon Phi or the Knight's Landing processors that it deployed do require some modernization effort, and I'll talk a little bit about that here. And then that'll be um, a you know as we talk about GPUs throughout the day, I think that'll be a theme as uh, in terms of how you really harness these these devices. So as sort of further motivation um, in terms of moving towards. Uh, GPUs in particular, as we think about replacing the Edison system at NERSC that was decommissioned um, in sort of the middle of, middle of last year and replacing it with the upcoming Perlmutter system, you can see the potential of GPUs to really kind of increase our, our energy efficiency and the total capability that we can pro provide to the users. So this is an example of a code um, running at sort of different, different 
different scales uh, on the Edison system and the Summit system, which has the current generation of uh, NVIDIA GPUs, and for a few different problem sizes. So if you compare, for example, these blue squares with the, the red squares and the blue circles with the red circles, you can see that we're uh, essentially achieving an order of magnitude in energy efficiency, which is along the diagonal in this plot. So the, the y-axis is time, the x-axis is um, power, and so time times power is energy. So if you look at along the diagonal, you get the average energy used for the, for the simulation. Um, so this is, I think, really exciting. There's a lot of uh, potential gain here as we go from the Edison system that just retired to the upcoming, upcoming Perlmutter system. <clears throat> so NERSC users have uh, been demonstrating kind of groundbreaking science on the, the K&L system that we've deployed. Here are several examples of really systems that couldn't have been done without the uh, calculations that couldn't have been done without the scale and resource that we provided in, in and Corey, and so we we think that um, you know the user community is really capable of uh, harnessing these these large scale energy efficient um, compute. And I want to say that uh, modernizing codes is possible. So I you know I mentioned a couple slides back that while Corey has been a boon, it also requires some effort on behalf of the code teams. Um, and what we found is that it it's it's definitely possible. Uh, we, we kicked off a NESAP program for Cori um, and found that on average when these teams looked at their application's performance, they analyzed it, they improved it, they ended up with on average about 3x improvement. Um, and one of the other takeaways is that when you improve your application targeting one of these sort of exascale-like architectures, um, you end up basically learning things about your performance, learning things about your code that end up improving it everywhere. So you end up with, um, you know, even the, the code running back on sort of a more traditional HPC system like Edison ended up being about two times faster after the, after the changes that you make. And so that's, I think, good news is that when you optimize your code, the improvements are basically relevant to multiple, multiple architectures. And so we're kicking off this um, this program again for, for Perlmutter where we've chosen about 25 different projects to work with and one of the ways that uh, you all can benefit even if you're not part of the NESAP program is by attending training sessions like this where we make the lessons <coughs> learned from NESAP available to the wider community um, through kind of training and documentation and then you know, open hackathons to, to anyone in the community. Um, okay, so let's talk about where this increase in performance is coming from on the exascale architecture. So on K and L and GPUs, getting performance um, kind of relies in you effectively using uh, essentially the increased parallelism that is coming in the, in the processors. So for example, you have order of 100 cores or I think sort of the equivalent might be SMs on a GPU. Uh, per, per processor, per chip, uh, with many what I would call hyperthreads on K and L or warps on a GPU to hide any, to hide any latency. Um, in the case of K and L, each one of those cores had what we call a vector processing unit that could process eight double precision wide vectors um, at, at a time, so you could basically, instead of operating on a single number, you operate on a vector of numbers. Uh, when you go to a GPU, that's basically a 32 wide vector that uh, we, I guess we would typically call a warp. Um, and then there's multiple flops even available per vector lane using sort of advanced instructions like FMAs, which stands for fuse multiply adds. So you can do a multiply and an add essentially in one cycle, um, as well as uh, tensor instructions on the, on the GPUs. Um, so this uh, basically adds uh, an increase in parallelism at almost every level in the, in, the, in the architecture that needs to be exploited. And then beyond that, you need to sort of make sure that you're utilizing the cache, the high bandwidth memory, 
and the entire kind of memory storage hierarchy in order to feed the processor to get the performance. So um, as, as a short way to kind of describe this change from sort of traditional CPUs to GPUs on sort of one on, on the, the sort of throughput extreme is that, you know, you could see um, the parallelism increasing across every single one of these lines, so going from 64 to 80, two threads to potentially 64 warps per SM. So this would be to this is sort of not the amount that it can compute every cycle, but the amount that you may want to use to hide the latency. Um, increasing the size of the vectors. And um, the way I think you can, you can think about this is that a CPU is kind of like a general purpose processor built for speed, whereas a GPU is really a processor built for throughput um, and, and data parallelism. Um, we, when we thought about the procurement of Perlmutter, we spent a lot of time um, determining how the workload would benefit from the GPUs. And we kind of did this analysis of the, the workload's readiness. This plot on the, this sort of pie chart on the left here shows the breakdown of the nurse workload by cycles. Uh, across the different codes that are used at the center. So you can see that VASP is the, the number one code. And then you know, there's, quite a lo there's quite a large tail here that ends up with around 700 different codes across the pie chart. Um, we found that because of you know, the use of GPUs already at places like Oak Ridge and other centers, that a good fraction of the codes were, were kind of already GPU enabled. Um, or they had, they kind of belonged to a category where we knew that other codes had been GPU enabled and they could kind of readily learn from those applications. Um, so the good news is that a good fraction of the codes that um, are at use at NERSC are already GPU enabled. Um, and then there are some that are, um, you know, down here where we, uh, you know, there's still work to be done. And you know, in some cases, we think it you know it could be it it, it could be a, a a challenge to get the GPUs to work. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Perlmutter and then how we broke it down between um, the sort of the GPU partition and um, the CPU the CPU part. So um, Nurse Nine is, will be named after Saul Perlmutter, who is pictured here. So he was the winner of the 2011. Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, you know, I guess that uh, you know one of the interesting stories about him is that when our director asked if he would uh, you know be willing to I guess share his name with our <laughs> computer, um, this was actually I think the first time that we've named a system after somebody who's still alive. Uh, but Paul, I, I think that Saul was um, fairly humble. I think one of the things that he was worried about is whether people would have to type. The entire uh, his entire last name every time they SSH to Perlmutter, and so I guess uh, he and our director made a compromise that you would be able to log in here to just sol.nurse.gov instead of the entire Perlmutter.nurse.gov. Um, so we we, des we designed this as uh, uh, from kind of the beginning as a system optimized for science. And as I said, part of our mission is to make sure that we can deliver the capability that the, the science community relies on. And so um, a large fraction of the system will be GPU accelerated, but there will be some CPU only nodes um, to meet the needs of some of the large scale like sort of simulation and data analysis uh, projects that we think are going to have that. Um, will require some time before they can port to the to the GPUs. Um, the you know one of the things I want to kind of emphasize here is that this is part of a bigger picture of NERSC's transition towards exascale um, and kind of post exascale like architectures. And we be, we began this process with Cori deploying the many core uh, Intel Knights Landing processors. We're continuing that transition. Uh, with the CPU plus GPU architecture of Perlmutter. Um, and then we expect NERSC 10 to be an exascale class, um, a class system that will likely arrive in 2025. 20, 20, 
And I think one of the trends here is that there is an increasing need for energy efficient architectures as you move forward in time in order to meet the requirements of the user community. Um, I also want to kind of show how this fits into the picture, the bigger picture of the DOE. Um, so this, this uh, you know, there are essentially three DOE um, uh, Office of Science computing facilities, one here at NERSC, the other at, the other two at uh, Argonne and Oak Ridge. And one of the, the interesting things that you can see is that these next three systems at each one of these, at each one of the facilities will be GPUs. Um, they will end, they'll end up being GPUs from three different vendors, so in, including Intel and AMD. Uh, but I think the trend is, is pretty clear here that we're moving towards these, these GPUs, these energy efficient processors that uh, are capable of sort of high throughput um, computing. So to, to tell you a little bit more about the specs of the system, uh, here is the breakdown of the, of the CPU nodes and also the, the, essentially the CPU parts of the, of the GPU nodes. Um, we'll be using the next generation AMD Milan CPU. These are the specs for the current generation. And so I think what you can expect, you can kind of put like a greater than or equal sign to essentially um, uh, you know, assume uh, just you know, bigger, better, faster for the, for the next generation. Uh, and then here is, the, is what we're expecting for the GPUs. So we'll have a configuration with one CPU and four GPUs per node. Uh, these, again, are the current generation Volta specs. And so for Volta Next, I think you can, again, kind of put a greater than or equal sign and just expect um, you know, somewhat bigger, better, faster. But the, the Volta Next product hasn't been uh, you know, formally announced yet. <clears throat> Okay, and so as I said earlier, we've, we've begun this process with NESAP, uh, working with our teams on, the, uh, on a number of the applications, getting them ready for particularly the, D G the GPU partition of Perlmutter. And so this is some of the early progress that we've been making and helps answer sort of why, why GPUs. Um, you can see that what I'm comparing here is the projected, roughly, the, the roughly projected Perlmutter GPU partition speed up. There's a lot of sort of slightly fuzzy numbers here, so you, you could probably think of this as like a back of the envelope projection um, versus, versus Edison. And you can see in a lot of cases we're making, um, you know, pretty, pretty good progress and that the overall scientific throughput will go up. Um, pretty significantly. There's a couple cases, uh, you know, there's a, there's a challenging code here, for example, Atlas that is sort of at the, at one where, you know, currently they're projecting actually worse performance on the GPUs and the CPUs, but, um, uh, it, you know, that's actively being, being tackled. Uh, and if we look at the different categories, we essentially have six categories or different types of applications in, and NESAP, and if we compare their projected GPU to CPU node performance on Perlmutter, um, we have uh, th this plot here. We can see that there's significant uh, performance increase using the, the GPU uh, projected for the, for the GPU no nodes over the CPU nodes for at least a representative app in each one of the categories. Um, it's not surprising to see machine learning really high. I think everybody knows that machine learning runs really well on the GPUs. Um, it's, 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 I think it's really great to see apps in each of these other categories high. Uh, you know, even, even the grids and particles, I think this number ends up being about a 9x speed up. And that's a pretty challenging category. That's where, where we include like the climate apps, the block structured grid apps, and like the pick and particle and cell codes, for, for example. Um, as, as one example of, of early progress, I'll just highlight this TomoPy uh, application. Um, so TomoPy is a, a tomographic reconstruction code that is used at the, um, I think, the Advanced Photon Source in Argonne National Lab. Um, and so essentially they have a bunch of uh, you, know, you know, a bunch of 2D images where they kind of rotate a sample in front of a camera and they try to reconstruct the 3D volume. Um, 
And so we had a, a postdoc here at NERSS working on this problem. And you can see that they ended up making significant speed ups by porting it to the, to the GPU, uh, where if you compare an Edison node wall time to um, the wall time on a node with four uh, of the current generation uh, NVIDIA Volta GPUs, you gain essentially an order of magnitude in performance. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things I want to highlight is that uh, this wasn't entirely just kind of a straight port of the code in, in the sense of let's kind of slap a few directives here and there. They actually did change the algorithm kind of fundamentally to use the GPUs. And I think in our experience, we found that, uh, you know, and sometimes you can, you know, annotate your code to use directives and, then we'll, and that will be sufficient. And in other cases, you kind of need to really rethink your algorithm. And you'll hear a little bit more about that throughout the day. Um, so I, I'm just going to kind of close here with some, a few practical notes about using, uh, you know, how you can go about using the GPUs on Cori, or sorry, on the upcoming Perlmutter system. So we uh, have kind of taken a practical approach here at NERSS. We realize that lots of folks have, uh, you know, existing GPU codes or have thought about porting to GPUs in the past. And I think we're basically um, ready to engage, you know, the community wherever they, they already are. So if that means you have a CUDA uh, port of your application, I think that's fine. There's some applications with CUDA Fortran, OpenACC, Cocos, Raja. Um, I think all of those are expected to work well on the system. Uh, that said, we do, we, we do have a goal of providing a path for users who haven't kind of already jumped into the GPU game and porting their applications from Edison onto Cori and then on to Perlmutter. And we're investing particularly in OpenMP um, in this, for this trajectory. And so we have an OpenMP NRE with PGI towards the goal of basically enabling directives, uh, a directive-based porting strategy from, from Cori to Perlmutter. And so at this point, we've basically agreed on this subset of the OpenMP standard that uh, we'll implement with PGI. And we've uh, been working on some micro benchmarks. And we expect that there'll be um, you know, a compiler available to test on the Cori GPU system and Perlmutter um, in, in the near future for this activity. You know, the, the other thing that I think is important as you're getting started is thinking about what are the optimization concepts involved in moving towards you know, an energy efficient architecture and GPUs in particular. And um, you know, I think that in our conversations with users, we've discovered that users kind of want to know the following, the answers to the following questions. So what part of my code should I move to the, to the GPU, for example? Um, how do I know which hardware features to target? Should I target the HBM? Do I need to worry about hiding latency? Should I use the shared memory? Um, do I need to worry about the, um, uh, the, the occupancy and, and so on? And then how do I know how my code performs in some absolute sense? And probably the most important question is how do I know when to stop? Um, and so we've been working a lot on this roofline model, and there'll be a roofline hackathon coming up in, a, in uh, just about a month where you can play with uh, the NVIDIA, the sort of up and coming NVIDIA tools in the, in the roofline and, and gathering roofline performance data. And so we've been working with NVIDIA to ensure that these tools can collect all the required metrics and that you can kind of analyze your performance in, a, in an absolute sense. So, I don't think I'm going to go through a, a detailed explanation of this performance model here, but um, if you're interested in sort of the answers to those questions, um, I'd encourage you to look out for this Roofline hackathon that's coming up. Okay, so this is my last slide, and I'll just basically conclude here with the answer of why GPUs. Well, the, I think the practical answer is basically because they're coming, um, but I, I hope I kind of convince you that they're coming for exciting reasons and that Perlmutter is really a system that is optimized for the scientific community. Um, 
And uh, it'll include both these NVIDIA GPU accelerated nodes where a large fraction of the capability will be, um, as well as the CPU only nodes. Um, and so with that, I will conclude. And I guess I could take questions if there are any questions. Anyone in the room, if you want to ask questions, you can either unmute yourself or type in the chat room. Okay. <laughs> Okay, one question. In general, as you're talking about various technologies and stuff, if you could highlight which ones are NVIDIA specific in some sense vendor buy-in versus are portable across Intel, AMD, NVIDIA GPUs. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> um, yeah, that, that's a good that's a good point. Um, um, so the you know some of the specifics of the architecture we can't quite uh, talk about because not I guess not all of the not all the products are completely announced. Um, but one of the reasons why we're advocating for OpenMP is, is because it is a kind of a portable approach between the, diff the different vendors. Um, as we talk here, the ones that, you know, there are two here that are clearly vendor specific, and those are CUDA and, and CUDA Fortran. Um, the, you know, OpenACC, Cocos, and Raja would be good, you know, potentially good performance portable options as well. Um, I think maybe your question is just more like a suggestion th of something to do throughout the day. Is that right? Or? Well, it, yeah, it's both in you know, long-term future planning, but also just throughout the day. I think mean, you're much more right. familiar with what's in yeah. specific versus not. Right. Getting expectations of should we be able to move between DOE centers? Yeah. Should we be able to move to Nurse 10 if it's not a right. NVIDIA system? Yeah. Or will we have to go through a rewrite again? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think in, in general that's a good thing, and maybe we could, the speakers could kind of think about that throughout the day. Um, you know, I think we are conscious of the, of the fact that our users, you know, don't want to have to rewrite their codes every two years or every three years as there's a new system, and that they also have accounts, kind of not just at DOE systems, but at systems probably throughout the throughout the world. Um, and so, performance portability is definitely um, something we care about, uh, and that's that is largely the motivation for why we think OpenMP is a particularly good path path forward. And I, you know, I, I would just comment that I do think it's a good, uh, it, it's actually nice that um, in some sense that the upcoming systems at Argonne and Oak Ridge will also be GPUs, uh, even if they are different vendors. I think um, for the first time in a, in, in a while, the architectures at least look similar enough that there's kind of hope that you can um, portably code for, for all of them.